book is Can't Not Do, The Compelling Social Drive That Changes the World. That's quite a book, and it's quite a title, and the author is tremendous. Paul Shoemaker is with us. Welcome, Paul. Good to see you again. How are you? Sorry about the bad grammar. <laughs> well, you know, it, it is kind of hard to say. It is a little bit. Uh, but it makes me want to say it again. But, you know, first, though, we got to yeah. go to something you talk about real early in the book. The yeah. world does not lack solutions. I mean, we've got famine, hunger. Yeah poverty, extreme poverty. We've got war. We've got violence of many different kinds. We've got women who are preyed upon by all kinds of people. And you're saying that the world doesn't lack solutions. Well, why don't we do it? Uh, so it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> there's no question. There's certain sort of like, you know, things that have been a spike in the challenges around the world. And with media today, it seems like you know it so much faster and so much more. But if you actually look at sort of like the, the course of the world across a whole lot of different dynamics and different variables, there are, so globally, things like literacy, hunger, we are so far where we, ahead of where we were 50 or 100 years ago. Domestically, um, teen pregnancy is half of what it was a generation ago. Um, gang violence is half of what it was a generation ago. And so my point isn't to say like everything's hunky-dory, but one of the things you want people to do is you want them to have hope that mm -hmm. change can happen, that they can be a part of that change. And I just want people to know, because the news only talks, for the most part, about the stuff that's broken. We actually do know how to fix a lot of things, and there's a lot of solutions that are making positive progress. So that's the point. So why are you qualified to write this book? I guess what I'm asking yeah. about is you. You, yep. came, you come from the, the business world, but then you moved into something else. Yep. So I moved into Social Venture Partners for 17 years, which is a philanthropic network um, that engages private sector people to get volunteering in the community and to help them be more philanthropic. And when we do that, we make investments in local nonprofits and we help them become stronger organizations. So we're looking for stronger civic leaders and stronger nonprofit organizations. So that's the work that I did for 17 years. So I definitely won't say to you that I'm an expert in any particular cause, but I hung around the sector for 17 years and I still am in a consulting role and I, worked with those folks on the ground. I worked at that intersection between civically, philanthropically minded people that wanted to invest in change and those folks on the ground in the community making that change. So I did see firsthand that there is progress and there are people out there in the world that know how to make change happen. So I'm not an expert in it, but I hung around those people a lot. What does the title mean? Can't not do. Yeah. So when I sort of had the notion of writing or people started bugging me to say, hey, there's a story in here, you should write a book. At first I said, nah, nah. Then what I said was, well, why don't I sit down and talk to some people and, and listen to them and see what they tell me and maybe that'll give you a message. And so I took, I don't know, the first 10 to 20 folks were SCP members, partners, and or nonprofit leaders that we'd worked with that I thought were sort of top of the line. And Number one, in listening to them, they did sort of convince me, hey, there is a story here to tell. It's not so much my story, it's their story, and how can I get it out into the world? But in the course of talking to them, literally unprompted, in a half a dozen of those first conversations, somewhere in the course of them explaining to me why they were doing what they were doing, they would have this sort of choppy moment in their, in their sentence where they'd say, well, I love, like, I, I really need to do this work. I got it, like, it's that I can't not do what I'm doing. So four or five people said it to me organically. And when I started to write the book, the woman that was helping me edit it said, that's your title. And I, of course, first said, well, you can't put bad grammar on the cover. But the longer I live with it and the publisher I work with, they said, yeah, that people will remember that title and will stick with them. So again, those aren't my words. Those are the words and sort of the, conveys the stickiness, the intensity, the longevity that it takes for somebody to really make social change. If you can find that can't not do, that's the key to you making change happen. All right, everybody watching this is going to think, okay, so here's a host who is kissing up to his guest, yeah. kissing up to the author. But I loved this book. Absolutely Thank love you. it. Thank you. Especially this phrase right here. Most people making significant change in our world are not famous, yeah. like Bono, Angelina Jolie, or Bill and Melinda Gates. They're regular heroes. They have an overwhelming passion for impacting their community for the better. So you don't have to be somebody to make change in the world? Nope. So what Bono and Angelina Jolie and the Gateses have, obviously they got more resources. They start with more assets. And 
my point certainly isn't that they can't make change. They can, and I hope that they make amazing change. But that, again, that 17 years with SVP and doing the research for the book, I just found again and again and again, sort of like a regular person, like you and me, that found that thing in life that, that was really their conviction. They went after it. So maybe the hill they had to climb was a little higher. Accumulating the resources took a little longer. You know, the journey maybe is a little choppier. <laughs> but individual human beings absolutely positively can make the change. I start the book with David Risher, who was a techie guy that said, hey, I want to do something about literacy around the world. He had a successful private sector career, but he wasn't anybody famous. And I end the book with Heidi Breeze Harris, and she did work in Africa, right? In both of their cases, they weren't anybody different than you and me. In one of their cases, there was like this epiphanous moment. In another case, it was sort of a, a journey to get to where it was. But both of them dug into a cause, they made a huge difference, and they didn't do it with the resources or the acclaim or the fame that somebody like Bono does. In fact, the, the book is just a series of stories yeah. of things that different people did, so let's just talk about some of them sure. right now. Um, Dr. Urbani was one of them. Decided to help in China with SARS. Yep. The last paragraph was a, included a quote from Dr. Urbani who was talking to his wife because he had three children. His wife was wanting to know, why are you going there? Yeah. And he says, if I can't work in the SARS situation, what am I here for? Answering emails or going to cocktail parties or pushing right. paper? Yep. The end wasn't good for him though. Yep. <clears throat> no, it wasn't. He literally lost his life. So you have to sort of remember back to when the SARS ec epidemic broke out for a period of a couple months, it was pretty frightening. Yes, it was. Right? And I, you know, stuff like that obviously comes along today that scares us too, but it was pretty frightening. And there was, there's actually a sort of another story in that about how a lot of health organizations around the world network themselves together in a pretty unique way to go after and find the problem. But it actually took a handful of people like Dr. Abani that he was willing to, he didn't know it, he was willing to put his life on the line to sort of trace down, you know, how do I get back to the root of the problem? How do I find the handful of people where this sort of came from? So that I can then get that information back to the WHO and the other organizations trying to network together a solution. But <clears throat> that guy, um, he was an example of somebody that had such conviction about creating change in his life. And, you know, he, in a way, he didn't necessarily know how he, what he was doing was gonna lead to a solution, but he followed his heart, I don't mean that in a schmaltzy way, I mean literally he followed his gut, he followed his passion and said I have to do something about that. And I'm sure he didn't expect to lose his life, right. but by virtue of him pursuing something and sticking with it and having his, in this case, can't not do, he made an enormous difference in saving not his life but probably hundreds of thousands of other lives. And probably because of the system that he helped put in place. Yeah. It's, he's saving lives today. No question. I mean, I, yeah, what, what could have happened downstream from that, right, that we just don't know about? Yeah. Um, and he, yeah, he was a great example of somebody that sort of in a, in a particular, in his case, it was a particular instance, a particular moment in time where his can't not do made a huge difference. A position that has one of the most difficult jobs has got to be an elementary school principal. <laughs> but you found an elementary school principal that had a can't not do. Her name is Ann Reese from White Center Heights School yeah. uh, right here in Seattle. Yep. Tell yeah, us yeah. about Ann Reese. So SVP had done some work in that community and folks kept telling us about that school and the progress that school had made. Um, <clears throat> this was four or five years ago. I've actually stayed in touch with her they went through three, four years in a row where they, they made such progress on academic performance, not just absolute, but relative to other schools. And White Center, is, as you know, is a, you know, in general, mixed socioeconomic part of town. A lot of kids with challenging backgrounds and challenging upbringings. Many different languages. <clears throat> Dozens of languages, right? But she, uh, uh, an elementary school principal, I would say, or a, a school principal, I think is probably one of the most thankless and most important jobs on the face of the earth. Yeah. Right, they, have, they make such an impact. And in her case, um, she, they basically introduced a different way of working with teachers inside that school. The, the, how they did it sort of doesn't matter, but she sort of took the way teachers taught and, and think in the school and sort of turned it on its end and it made a huge difference for the teachers themselves, and then it made a huge difference for the students. 
And it was just a story of how, you know, here's someone that walks into a school that doesn't have any business breaking academic curves, that doesn't have any business, you know, churning out the best, some of the best teachers in the state, and yet they did. And obviously Ann Reese has to be good, but like a lot of us, we might be good at something, and that will get us this far. And that conviction and that passion and that can't not do and that spirit and that willingness that she had to wade into it, that's what takes her and her school the rest of that distance. And that people willing to do that, that they make the difference. And part of the reason to write the book is I just I want more people to know that there are the Ann Reese's out there in the world that are like you and me and to understand how much difference she can make and that we can make if we pursue our passion. One of the, the concepts you talk about is optimism. I mean, yeah. it's great to be around an optimistic per a person, but you took it a step further. You talked yeah. about reality-based optimism. Yeah. Yep. What's the difference? So I call it, I think, determined optimism. And my example of that was David Risher. So um, <clears throat> if, you, if you work on a social problem, it's challenging. Uh, the solution uh, is sometimes hard to find. The outcome is almost always hard to measure. The context you're doing in it, by definition, is messy and complicated. So <clears throat> being able to navigate your way to that <clears throat> um, can be really hard. So you have to have a combination of determination and optimism. And one of the points that I make in the book is if you are just determined on this sort of long, hard journey, that may wear you out. You, you know, that may eventually sort of defeat you. Um, so you can't just be determined. You can't just be optimistic because it's going to get rough, it's going to get tough, it's going to get hard. And if you're just sort of airy-fairy optimistic, you're not going to stick with it when the going gets tough. So those people that find that balance between those two things, they have what I call determined optimism. They have a combination of both those things that sort of, you know, makes them believe out there is a solution and enables them to stick with it through the hard stuff in the short term. Mm. Uh, in fact, you, you also talk about, uh, and this is a story of Kerry McClanahan, you, you say that the work doesn't have to be yeah. epic. And so I'm asking you, are small victories enough? Does that, does, is that enough for us to continue our can't not do? Um, so number one, one way I'd put that is obviously a lot of small victories adds up to a big victory. Um, number two, not all of us have all the time in the world to do this full time or part time or whatever it is. So what I try to do in the book is I, I think I have about 20 stories of people in there and I tried to mm -hmm. use you know, famous people, not famous people, folks that had full time and a little bit of time and all over the map, and right? So Carrie's an example of somebody, she was a mom, she was running a business, and she only had so, a, so like a few hours right in the week. Yeah, she had no time. Correct, <laughs> she had no time like the rest of us. <clears throat> um, but she basically found her passion on early childhood, and she put, the time she put into it, number one, she was one of thousands of people in Portland putting a little bit of time into early childhood. So at some point in time, you have to believe that you are part of something bigger than yourself and that your contribution will add up. If everybody that had a little bit of time doesn't give a little bit of time, then we got a big hole, right? So we need people like Carrie. That's what she could give. And I think there's probably also something to the point that she only had a little bit of time, so that made her think even harder about how do I leverage myself. And in her case, it wasn't so much, say, working with a kid. Her, the business she ran was a small business marketing promotion agency. And education issues like early childhood need a marketing and they need promotion. So that was the skill that she lent to that challenge and that problem. That was the most leveraged thing that she could do with the time that she had. And again, I want people out there that have two hours a week, you know, when Game of Thrones is over, <laughs> so that they can go out in the community and use that time really intensely and in a really positive way. I've got this view, and it's probably, uh, uh, some people may think it's kind of nasty, but uh, the view is that everybody does things for their own reasons, mm -hmm. uh, and everybody's looking for something out of it. And I want to bring in Lisa Chin, mm -hmm. um, and she asked this question. She said, does this work really uh, challenge my boundaries, that my own identity and my capacity to love? Does, and does this work make you happy? And she said, I completely believe in what I'm doing and who I am, and that uh, to me is far more fulfilling than are you happy? Yeah, so if I do this work if I find my can not do what do I get out of it? Um, so one distinction I was trying to draw with Lisa was And don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-happiness But we sort of have moments in life. I think where we have a choice between happiness and, and fulfilling 
And everybody may have slightly different definitions of that, but I think you sort of get the gist of that. I can sort of fulfill myself by being happy, or maybe I can fulfill a purpose, right, by doing something that is challenging in the world with my time. So in Lisa's case, and she's a pretty driven person, um, and so one distinction for me is the difference between happy and fulfilling, and they're not mutually exclusive, but if you sort of have choices in life, I think when you get to the end of it, if you look back and you say, I spent my time doing fulfilling things versus happy things, I think you're gonna be more satisfied with the life that you lived. Um, I also want, drew the distinction, because I want people to know in this work that you won't do this necessarily because it'll make you happy, but it might fulfill you. So your purpose for doing the work is to make the difference in the community. But there happens to be this both secondary benefit and the fuel that drives you forward is that you feel fulfilled from it. Right? You've got to, at some point in time, you've got to get something from it. That isn't selfish, that isn't whatever. It's got to fill your own soul, your own spirit. And that gives you the fuel to keep going on. So again, I, I want folks to know that if you're starting this work and, and it's not necessarily immediately something that makes you happy, mm -hmm. but it fulfills you even though it challenges you, I think there's something really deep and really powerful that's gonna fuel you to do that work that much more and that much more deeply. What if in pursuing my can not do, I fail and yeah. I have to leave a hard place? Yep. You <clears throat> talked about that in the book yep. too. So like anything we pursue in life, especially taking on social challenges, you may fail. Um, part of the reason for folks to find their can not do is because it, you just know that there's inherent failure in this work. There's inherent failures in starting businesses. There's Failures in raising our kids, <laughs> right? There's, yeah, I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah, and I've lived that too sometimes. Um, but there's a challenge that um, we all have to sort of like deal with, which is, hey, we may, we're not gonna bat a thousand, we're gonna have failures. And so I want, part of again, what I want folks to know in the book is you're not alone. You may make mistakes, you may go down the wrong path. And if you do, um, it will hurt, it's painful. Number one, take real gratification or fulfillment on the notion that you had the courage to do it in the first place. Number two, when you sort of leave the situation, if you feel like you can't sustain yourself in it, um, try to sort of, you know, patch the quilt back together, make sure you don't sort of just like leave a void, leave a hole. And number three, there is virtue in the journey itself. There's a purpose, an end goal we're trying to get to, right? Make the world a better mm -hmm. place. But, and you may also have sort of move the boulder a little further up the hill. Maybe you aren't the one that pushed it across. Maybe it sort of rolled back down on top of you and somebody else has got to pick it up and keep rolling it. But you did make progress. You did, you may have done more than you think you did. It's just gonna take longer for it to play out. So every one of those is just sort of a way of fo helping folks understand that failure happens and that when it does, to maybe give them a context to put it in that helps them not feel so discouraged or want to walk away from this work. I just want everybody who's watching to know that, that before we end the show, we're going to ask seven questions that will help you get to your can't not do as well. And also in the book itself, at the end of each chapter, you've got five key yeah. points. Yep. Why'd you do that? Just trying to make this thing as actionable as I possibly could. So when I sort of agreed with my colleagues and my friends, hey, there's a story in here to be told, you know, one choice is to write I don't know, a big long academic paper or a research oriented thing that I might want to publish in the academic world, whatever. And there's value in that, but my, for me, my orientation was very much more about like, how do I take what I learned, get it out in the world so that more and more people could access it. So I tried to, I didn't want to write it academically. I didn't want to write it sort of professorially. I didn't want to write it too long. I, I wanted it to be story based with some facts woven mm -hmm. in there. So <clears throat> I chose to write the book that way because I wanted it to be accessible to people. So as you said a minute ago, there are seven questions that I posed in there. And the five things at the end of each chapter are trying to help you put those things into action, into motion. Seven questions sounds a little bit simple. I, I wanted to simplify what I think is complex and make it simple and accessible to people. And then the five questions are ways you can start to dive and dig deeper into each, within each of those seven questions to help the person sort of dive in and go deeper. I'm not a 30-something anymore. I don't know if you noticed. Um, who can be, who can have a can not do? Uh, anybody, any age. I mean, seriously. I, I, again, in the book, I think the youngest person I had was maybe someone in their 20s, and there's clearly examples of kids in the world younger than that. The oldest one was a guy that was in his 70s. Um, 
don't let, I guess don't let any sort of convention, if you can help it, stop you. Like, like I don't know, I don't have enough money, that'd be one reason. Um, I don't have enough time, that might be another reason. I don't know the solution, that might be another. And then maybe I'm, I think I'm too old or I'm too young. Every one of those is a, you know, it's a little bit of a hill to climb. But every one of them at the end of the day is an artificial barrier. Um, you, we all have, hey, I guess we don't know how much time we have left on the earth, so don't wait based on how long you think you might still be around. And B, the guy using the book, the older guy, Dwight, I mean, his, what he learned in 36 years of focusing on a cause, and not everybody does that, but what the experience and the knowledge he had at that point about that cause is just, it's immeasurable. So, you know, he, he stuck with the cause for decades because he believed in it, and then what he learned about it was, he had so much to teach people at that point, and for him, age was truly a state of mind, not a state of his like physical condition. There's something common through so many of the stories, and it's humility. Yeah. Um, this wasn't about them. Instead, it was about the cause or about whatever they were trying to do that was their can not do. Kevin Shaw was part of it. Yeah. <clears throat> you had talked about something in the in the book where someone very really close to you challenged your humility. Yeah. 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 So, and humility is an interesting sort of concept, <clears throat> probably can overthink it. But I didn't want people in the book to think humility just meant, you know, you back off, you don't dive in, you always deflect the credit. I don't know if that's humility so much as that is, you know, sort of maybe chickening out sometimes when there's a challenge in front of you. <clears throat> um, I would always sort of think of myself as humble, and I would like to still think I am. I had a woman that was my executive coach for a few years and we were in the middle of one of our sessions and she sort of said, hey, describe yourself to me. And I said a handful of words and then I said, I'm, you know, I think I'm humble. And then she said, she sort of stopped for a few seconds and smiled at me. And when she smiles, like, I know it's coming, I'm just gonna get <laughs> hammered. And she said, I think your humility is blank, blank. <clears throat> and, mm -hmm. you know, for 10 seconds, I'm, you're like, who do, you think, who do you think you are? And then I realized that I, at times, I think I did use humility to sort of hide behind it, right? Here's a tough conversation on the table, but you can say I'm not gonna take part because I'm humble. No, that's actually just backing away from the problem that needs you to lean into it. So humility matters because it's so powerful because it attracts other people. It, it is so powerful because it makes the cause and the challenge not about you but about the people around you. It's so powerful because humility puts more oxygen in the room for people to work on the problem, right? And we don't have to worry about each other's egos, we can worry about the problem and the cause at hand. I also didn't want folks to think that humility just means back away, don't say anything, be quiet, back away from the situation. That's false humility, and that's what that friend of mine, that coach, challenged me about, and she was 100% right, even Some, if I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you have to step out there and lead, and I guess that's what she was talking yes, about. Yes, correct, yep. All right, so let's say I'm in my mid-60s, I've got a brand new passion, mm -hmm. because everything I've done in the past has been replaced. Yep. Can I still make it? <clears throat> Um, I think there's no reason why you can't. Um, I guess unless your mind sort of like says, hey, I'm done and I can't you know, retrain myself. Um, if somebody's in their 60s, one of, the, like one of the chapters and one of the questions in the book is about who are you at your core? And what I'm trying to get people to get at is, again, there might be, there are some nights people take on a cause because just you know, a rocket falls out of the sky, hits them in the head and boom, off they go. But more often than not, the ones that really dive into it, they will, if you look back through your life, if you look back through your relationships, if you look through back through what you did, there are some threads or a thread in there that is common to what you've done. And so I would say if you're in your 60s, really spend some time on that question, like who am I at my core? What do I know about? What do I, you know, what's the talents I have? What's the experience I have? What is it that I know deeply in my core? Because by that time in life, there's a handful of things you do know about yourself and about the world. And how do I now leverage those? And so, yeah, I, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. That'd be sort of uh, pie in the sky, but just don't let it stop you from wanting to make change happen in the world. There's never, I don't know, there's so many causes and challenges out there that we are making progress on, and what they, but yet what they depend on is people that don't let age or money or time or whatever resources be the barrier in their head. Mm -hmm. So I just want mm -hmm. folks to sort of break through those mental barriers like it Sounds like they, they don't let fill in the blank get in the way Correct. of cannot do. Exactly. We have two it. minutes left, I gotta get to these okay. questions. Number one, are you a determined optimist? We've talked about that. Yeah. That's really important, huh? Very determined, I mean, very important. The combination is what matters. And then the question you just asked, who are you at your core? 
study, understand, think deeply about who you are, what makes you passionate, what you came from, and there's, a, there's probably a few threads that run through that that will lead you to what you ought to pursue. Number three, uh, are you willing to go to hard places? I just want folks to know that if you do this work and it matters, number one, it's going to be tough. And frankly, if it doesn't get hard and it doesn't get challenging, it doesn't you know, sort of break your emotions sometimes, you probably are not deep enough into it to really make a difference. You're not close enough to the problem for it to hurt. But if you do get close enough, that's when you're going to make change happen and it is going to be a hard place. Next one, are you ready to be humble and be humbled? Yep, we talked about that. The first part we talked about, the humbled with a D on the end is, again, if you do this, just like the hard places, if you do this work deeply enough, you are gonna, you're gonna lose, you're gonna fail, and you're gonna you know, get your ego handed to you more than once. <laughs> uh, can you actively listen? Very important skill to have. Uh, one of the most, maybe the most important sort of underrated skill thing in the world. Um, I learned this one, and I use the example in the book from my wife. She's the most amazing listener. If every one of us reflects on an experience when we are really fully listened to, you get done with it, you've learned more about yourself, and you feel empowered. And as a skill to go out in the world and make change happen, being an active listener is one of the most powerful ones you could take with you. You talk about an effective meeting, and an effective meeting yeah. typically is one where most people are listening. Right, correct. So you got, uh, you got one mouth and two sets of ears. Another example I use in the book is a friend. Uh, she is an amazing listener, and by virtue of listening more, she understands the problem that much better. It also means that when she does talk, people know that she's not just trying to run her mouth or trying to you know, get a word in edgewise. She's really thought about it. She's made her words count, and people listen to it that much more intensely. The sixth of seven is describes your position, your title when you were at uh, Social Venture Partners. Yeah. It's, uh, do you believe one plus one equals three? Yeah, so we all know the world's connected <clears throat> in any way or dimension that you want to um, sort of define that. And connection is the leverage in the world today. Whether it's technology, or human relationships, or social media, whatever it is, the more connection you can create, the more power that you have to create positive change. And I just want people to, like for some folks that's really natural, for other folks it isn't, but understand how important of a strategy connecting is, not just in sort of building your network, but in helping to make change happen. The last question, we'll ask it of you. What's yeah. your can't not do? Um, what I believe is my can't <clears throat> not do is it's less about one specific cause. Some folks are, have expertise in one particular area. What I think I'm really good at is people and culture and organizations and leadership. So I sort of run the other direction. I have a real passion for helping people find the most of their potential in life and helping them realize their dreams and get the most out of what they can do with it. So that's what I hope and I believe my gift and my talent is in the world and that's my can't do that I want to take out there. Very well. The book makes a heck of a lot of sense to me. Can't not do the author's Paul Shoemaker. Paul, thank you for being with thank us. Thank you.